We'll take the next 20 minutes now. Uh, and really, what I'd like to do is drill down on some of the collective or common themes that, that you all mentioned, the first of which um, that really jumped out to me was this theme of partnerships. In other words, this idea that whether or not it's lithium or nickel or manganese, you're not going to be able to do it alone, right? And I don't, I, think that's, I don't think that's particularly rare in the mining business, wherever you are. But, you know, James, when I was looking at the uh, Ioneer corporate presentation recently, there's this interesting slide that you have where this almost kind of looks like a donut. And yeah. Ioneer's in the middle, and you've got 12 or 13 other smaller <laughs> circles around Ioneer. And these are, these are meant to represent different partnerships for different part of your supply yeah. chain. So maybe, James, just to start off with you, talk about yeah. the necessity, the importance of partnerships as you're looking to build Rhyolite Bridge. And then I'd love to hear from the other gentlemen as well. Sure. Thank you for bringing it up. Uh, the, the, uh, back to technology. I mean, you. you when you're trying to build a very large, sophisticated operation like this, you, you, you need a lot of talent, mm -hmm. okay? So the way we look at it is we know we have to have a strong owner team, and we've been working very hard to build a strong owner team. We also need to have a strong equity partner that can help us in areas that we need assistance. So Sabanye Stillwater was a terrific partner for us, and they came in on, on a common equity basis. But for the last six years, we've had a circle of people like, well, Floor Corporation obviously has been our EPCM. They did our definitive feasibility. They're gonna be the EPCM when we start construction. So continuity there is very important. You know, we brought in, Veolia has been working with us for all the way since mm -hmm. the pilot plants and in there in the pilot plants. F.L. Schmidt, the same thing with that. ABB is more recent, but been several years they've been working with us. So the quality of the people that you surround yourself with is critical. I mean, you know, when you're a young company, you, you can't possibly muster all those talents. So we, we think of these as, as part of the family, and, and we treat everybody with a lot of respect. We, we listen very hard to their ideas. And fortunately now, we've, with the continuity of, of this team, uh, we, we, we have high confidence now and what it's gonna to take to build it. And look, this industry does not have, the lithium industry, does, and some people have mentioned that earlier, doesn't have a particularly great track record of getting these things done on time and on budget. And you know, we, have, we, we think that part of that has to do with really having the right people, mm -hmm. having the continuity <laughs> of those people, so that when you go to build, you really know what you're talking about. And, and that's what we've done, and, and our partners are very important to us. Sure. Henry, relationship with Rio Tinto, just curious on your thoughts on partnerships and how you leverage a lot of, of the exper experience there. Good question. Um, I have Rio Tinto uh, in the room. Um, <laughs> we, we have been partnering with Rio Tinto for quite a long time, and I think we have the nimbleness of a small company like ourselves. We've gone from five people to 91 people in about 18 months. Wow. Um, Rio Tinto has been instrumental in coming to site, supporting us, helping us, uh, we are meritocracy, so we're looking for the best ideas. Uh, we put that on, on the table um, as recently as five weeks ago. We attend to send, um, I think, about 11, 12 people to site. And we ask, we attend to take, take our plan apart. I think the statistic is the average mining project is over budget by 137%, something like Sad. that. Yeah. Um, I think that's kind of lowballing it. Um, <laughs> so so I, I, I think it's a really good combination between a very large company with a lot of experience thousands of people, and we are 91 people. Sure. Um, I think maybe I can mention also, we, we are um, a, uh, we have signed a contract with uh, Tesla. Um, yes. I don't know if Turner is still in that room. Um, I went to Tesla back in April 2019 with this crazy idea about creating a US supply chain from the mine to the battery for nickel. Um, they were way ahead of me. Uh, fast forward, we signed a, a deal with Tesla whereby we provide an offtake of a U.S. nickel con. Uh, what I didn't, didn't see coming was uh, 45X I mean, back in the day. So you have to take U.S. nickel into 99% plus. Um, you don't have to refine it today. So how do you do something like that without an OEM that's thinking completely outside of the box? Um, and three, we're also pushing um, the idea of integrated project development. So instead of having, you know, signing big contracts with big engineering <coughs> companies, we went to construction companies. We said, why, why didn't you put your profit at risk for this project? We know the statistic. We know like, we don't have much of a chance to make it on budget and on time. Let's flip this around 
and create called an, it's called an IPD, Integrated Project Development. And we put people around the table, not companies, but people. Um, so we, we haven't got that all figured out, but I think it's moving in the right direction. That's great. And Pat, obviously, is South 32, kind of a different position, bigger company in production. Obviously, Hermosa is, is moving towards there, but just your thoughts on the development of Hermosa and, and the partnership thesis. Yeah, I think one thing I probably think is important to talk about on partnerships, uh, and again, I touched on it a couple of times in the presentation around uh, next generation mining sustainability. I do think we often talk about in South 32, we're, we're mining other people's resources. Mm -hmm. And so the partnerships that I think are critically important if we're going to fill out this supply chain uh, and provide domestic resources, uh, there's the, the formal piece around actual permitting, mm -hmm. and then there's the social license piece around the communities and, and stakeholders. And so I think finding a way early in these projects to build construct not just build constructive relationships, but establish partnerships is critically important uh, with tribes, with local communities, with local government. Um, the, the, all the stakeholders have to benefit from these projects uh, in the same way that the nation does from the raw materials we provide um, or, and if they don't want us there, then, then, then that's a challenge. That's going to be a challenge for mm -hmm. us to, to build out the supply chain. So I think there's the formal pr permitting process, but the industry being really good and committed and genuine around forming partnerships with stakeholders, communities, tribes, I think is going to be another key element if we're going to develop projects like this successfully. Sure, and so the state level, that, that license, if you will, I completely understand that without that, you know, you don't have anything, never mind permits. But Question for the three of you, you know, there's so much talk about the Inflation Reduction Act and NEPA and trying to get sort of federal level permits, but what about, what experiences you had in, in Arizona and, you know, no, other parts of the, of, of the country with state level permitting? Is it easier? I mean, are these state level officials trying to make it easier for you guys to get where you need to go? Or what are the sort of the differences on the state versus the federal level? Maybe, Pat, if you want to start. Yeah, I think it varies highly by state. I think we're fortunate Arizona is a really a jurisdiction that's really supportive of mining. It's had mining for a very long time. Uh, the state agency is very efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, it runs very smoothly. Uh, we we get our state permits in 12 to 15 months. Um, so yeah, I think that that's not uh, not a risk that is a high risk for projects like this. Um, I do think the litigation on the back end, which is a challenge both on the federal and state level, is probably a common risk that we all have. But um, in our jurisdiction, the, uh, the state permitting processes have been, been very smooth. And, and that's really all we need on private land to move forward. And that's one reason why private you know, land, things sure. have gone quite smoothly there. Sure. Henry, your thoughts on state level sort of approaches and, and interactions, please. We are on state land um, to begin with. Um, I, I think uh, it's the, the permitting before the permitting that's important. I, I, I think the mistake people sometimes make is you propose something to the state that's just not going to fly. Um, and I, I just find that if you go back and you actually go through an iterative design process and make the mistakes on paper, like you can make as many mistakes as you want, just get through it very quickly, fail fast. Um, so that, you know, from that point of view, the state has been extremely cooperative with us in the pre-permitting process. We in, in two or three weeks from now, we'll be going formally into the environmental review process. But that's on the back of about 14 months of designing, redesigning, going back, thinking again. We even split the, the mind from the, uh, the actual processing mm -hmm. to go to a brownfield site. Um, what we thought 18 months ago, if we did not have the state cooperation, if we did not take the community, if we did not listen to the community, if we did not listen to the sovereign nations around us, the project would not look like it looks today. So no, I, 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 th I think, um, again, there's a lot of criticism against state processes. We find it to be extremely useful Great. if you actually listen. <laughs> Great. James. You know, it's interesting you say listen. I, I, I mean, that's one of the themes that, that I think all of us have to have. We, we have to have a social license to operate. I mean, the, 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 I mean we, I, I'm always amazed at how many people will, you know, in the left wing of the in NGOs will say, you know, say that we just want to destroy the land, we just, all these terrible things about us. And I'm thinking, I guess that must have happened at some point, and they must remember it, but it doesn't have anything to do with us. I mean, I don't know what they're, it, it's like, I feel like we're talking about two different things. So we, one of the things we do is we listen hard, and, and, and we've had to make a number of adjustments to take into account 
legitimate concerns about various things, and we, we've, we've made those changes through, but we've had to work hard at it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, our case, uh, the state of Nevada is a little bit like Arizona. It's, a, it's a generally a mining-friendly jurisdiction, and so we have not had troubles with the state agencies. They've been very, I mean, they require a lot of work, but, but they've been efficient, and we have our state, two key state permits. The, unfortunately for us, of course, we, we're, in the, we're on federal lands. You, you don't get to pick where your great assets are. They're, they're, that's where it is. And uh, that's been a much more challenging. And, and I just, maybe it could lead to something else here, but there's a lot of conversation in Washington where we are about NEPA reform. I, it's just endlessly talking about NEPA reform. We need NEPA reform, okay? I, I'm not arguing that. But it, it, the, the, perhaps the more challenging is before NEPA. <laughs> when you're trying to get into NEPA, because there's a formal process that you have to go through for the government to actually say, we hereby give you a notice of intent, you're in the NEPA process. Hmm. That has been very difficult, challenging work to do because there's not as much structure. Like when we come into the NEPA process, we have, we're working on a 12 month process now, but we've been working for six years to get there, okay? So I, I think we need to talk more about the broader question of better coordination, better focus. I'm not saying to not do it right, but there's a bit of a disconnect between you know, what companies are facing. You know, if you move towards doing engineering, heading towards construction, you're having to ramp up your expenditures very rapidly. And the government doesn't seem to care. I mean, they're just gonna go about it in whatever time frame they've got. And so I do think we need to be more, industry needs to be respected and, it needs to, and there needs to be more care about how we're spending our money trying to bring these on, and they should be very respectful of what they, what they ask for. So I think we've, uh, we've gotten that now, but it, it, it's not, it hasn't been easy. And where do you think that rethinking of the whole process starts? Is it with a specific department? Is it in the White House? Is it, I mean, where, where would you start if you had an opportunity to get somebody or get a group in a room and say, listen, ladies and gentlemen, Yeah just basically repeat what you had said to them, and then they said, okay, fine, like this is how we're gonna do it. Where does it start? Well, I, I actually think, unfortunately, it's a whole of government kind of thing. I, I don't think that you can just rely on one agency. I think the agencies are all weighing into this because they, they have different interests. Uh, but I do think that, you know, and I think it needs to start with the White House. I mean, I think the White House has to drive the policy, and then, you know, the Department of the Interior needs to be realize that they're a part of a broader set of conversations. And mm -hmm. I think that, by the way, I, 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 I mean, positive news is I think that over the last year, we've seen a lot of excitement about this. I mean, people are really engaging with each other. There is a whole of government approach now. And I think that makes an enormous amount of difference. Okay, we've got a couple of questions here. I'm, I'm a little limited on time, let me see. Yeah. Um, this one specifically for you, Pat. Why do you think manganese is less discussed when it is just as important? <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I would like to think the fact that uh, you know we we, we don't we, we haven't seen the manganese resources in the U.S. come forward, and sure. um, it's probably uh, you know other than cobalt, the <laughs> one where there's not a lot of options in the U.S. Um, you know, obviously current chemistries, it doesn't feature as much as others, but uh, I go back to the fact that uh, just about everyone we talk to are thinking about or considering some manganese-rich chemistry going forward, mm -hmm. uh, either for, for cost or, or range or energy density benefits. And so um, I think it's a, a factor of, of presence of resources. Um, it's been the lithium and nickel space, I think, has been top of mind uh, in terms of scarcity. Sure. Probably a perception around scarcity. We've seen <clears throat> the supply chain react to that, that perception. Um, and so I think that, that does make uh, our project all the more important. Sure. Uh, we've got time for one final question. This is for the three of you, and I'm glad we've got you know, lithium, nickel, and, and manganese represented here. Um, there's sort of buzz or there's talk of, of green lithium getting a price premium or um, you know, clean nickel getting a price premium relative to traditional processing technologies and process material. What are your views? Uh, do you think we will see kind of a two-tiered pricing structure for say IRA compliant material versus non-IRA compliant material in the supply chain or is it all just sort of 
produce what I can, and I will you know, pay the market rate for it. What do, what do you think, James? Maybe we can start with you. I, I, you know, I don't know uh, the answer to that question. I hear about that. I, I haven't seen it in the conversations. Yeah. I, I, so I, I think it's more made up at this point, but it may, it may <laughs> turn out to be. But what I will say, though, is that they are very, it, people are very, the, our customers are extremely interested in our green credentials. I haven't, I haven't seen them anybody say, you know, I'd like to give you a little bit more money for that, but I, I definitely think that they're very interested in it. And so we are, and we're interested in it because that's what our business is about. So I, I don't know. Some people think so, I don't know. Yeah, Henry, any thoughts? I don't know, but yeah. what I can tell you <laughs> is, um, if you look at the, typically nickel is a percentage of LME, so I cannot predict anything LME. But I think if you have a, a green or clean nickel, your percentage of LME that you get paid, um, take its public information, IGO and BHP, um, there's a steep premium in that payable for the nickel. So we, I, I think we see that already in the world of nickel. LME, I don't know. <laughs> All right, yeah, the nickel question on the LME, I think is still being resolved maybe or being considered. But any, any thoughts on pricing before we end? I, you know. I, I think it remains to be seen. Yeah. Uh, we, I didn't mention before, we have two MOUs with potential manganese end users that have plans for facilities in North America um, and are in discussions with many others. And I, I don't know about pricing, but what I would say, I think part of the intent and the need to reshore the extractive part of the supply chain is for higher ESG standards mm -hmm. and enhanced sustainability. So whether it factors into pricing or not, I think remains to be seen. But I think undoubtedly we're going to have to meet a standard. You know, there's talks about IRMA and, and sure. other other yeah. options maybe for a standard. TSM. Uh, and I think that is that is going to be part of of what we will need to achieve uh, and an important part of why uh, we can domestically produce, you know, we can domestically produce these resources more sustainably, uh, but there, there, there will likely be some sort of standard like that. Yeah, totally agree. Well, listen, we are out of time. Yeah. I just want to thank you all for your, your presentations and your, your insights here. Great, thank you. Thanks.